Good afternoon. Welcome to SCA's webinar with Dr. Bill Little on Expression of Sequence Stratigraphy in Outcrop, the Book Cliffs, Utah. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of our audience. So I will post some polling questions and I'll ask you to respond. So the first question is, what is your primary discipline? Petroleum engineers, geoscientists, facility engineering, petrophysics, or other? And we're starting to get responses now. So it looks like the majority are geoscientists. The vast majority, over 80% are geoscientists. A few petroleum engineers and uh, maybe 10 or 11% other. So we'll close that poll and share the results. And then I will pull up the next polling question. How many years of full-time experience do you have in the oil and gas industry? So a bit more diversity in our sample this time. Looks like we have quite a few with less than one year, 27%. And uh, let me close and show those results. Over 23% have over 30 years experience. So, but quite a spread in, in the other groups as well. So let me make sure I'm sharing my slides. And um, today you are joining uh, another of SCA's webinars in our webinar series, uh, The Expression of Sequence, Stratigraphy, and Outcrop, The Book Cliffs, Utah. And we welcome Dr. Bill Little. Uh, Bill is an instructor for SCA and has over 14 years experience in teaching at the university level in both sedimentary geology and geological mapping and quite a bit of experience in industry as well. Received his doctorate from CU Boulder, MS and BS degrees in, from BYU, and he's also been associated with uh, uh, Missouri Rolla, uh, MST now, and a, a number of other uh, colleges. And currently he's teaching at BYU-Idaho and so we welcome Dr. Little today. Um, Bill teaches a field trip for SCA. Uh, it's scheduled in May of, in 2019, and similar title, the book Cliffs Utah, a case study in coastal sequence stratigraphy. And this is a uh, field trip where you start out in Salt Lake and then you get to see the book Cliffs in Utah. So uh, hopefully those of you who attend today's webinar might be interested in signing up for that. Registration is now open and you did get a discount if you register before year end uh, for this class that's offered next year in May. Uh, we can also schedule it as an in-house class if you'd like to schedule it for your company. And SCA, in addition to training, we also offer consulting, direct hire projects and studies and uh, all sorts of consulting work. So I'd like to remind our attendees today that you are being muted during the call, so you will have a chance to post your questions in the question field on the dashboard, and then we will cover those at the end of the presentation, and you will be anonymous. So feel free to ask uh, whatever question you wish, and I, I will read them or I will summarize them. And so without further ado, I'm going to give Bill the presentation rights. And Bill, it's all yours. Okay, is that? Uh, Looks good. All right. Well, thank you, Susan, and uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, the uh, the purpose of this webinar is to provide an overview or a summary of the uh, the field course that uh, the Susan mentioned that we teach uh, in the spring on sequence stratigraphy in the uh, in the book cliffs of uh, of Utah. Uh, because of a limited uh, limited amount of time, uh, I'm not going to go into a detailed explanation of concepts and principles, but rather uh, what I want to do is to uh, show the actual expressions of these features as they appear in uh, in outcrop. So uh, in a way, it'll be a a picture show, lots of uh, lots of photographs. 
Okay, um, so first of all, you know, why, uh, why would it be significant to take a, a course like, uh, like this one? Uh, in part, it's uh, simply that the, the book cliffs have become one of, if not the premier locality on the, uh, the Earth's surface in which sequence stratigraphy is, uh, um, is, is understood, is taught, and, uh, and, and is expressed. Uh, in addition to that, petroleum and coal co companies are more and more using the, sequ or the book cliffs area uh, as an analog for their uh, for their fields. Uh, one of the comments that I often receive from uh, from participants is uh, that the the real benefit of taking a course like this one is that it gives you a chance to, in essence, stand inside of your field or inside of your your reservoir to see the facies and the facies associations, uh, the way that they change laterally and uh, and vertically, uh, to see some of the uh, uh, inhomogeneities that are present within a rock body that may not <clears throat> that may not appear in uh, some of the geophysical study methods, um, and to uh, uh, see the, the scale of the different rock bodies as they uh, as they appear in um, <clears throat> in their fields. Uh, the uh, the photograph that I have here, uh, notice that the well logs on there. The last time I taught this course the, this past summer, one of the participants, Brian Stevens took a log from a local well, superimposed it on a couple of the photos that I had in the, in the guidebook to, uh, to illustrate how these outcrops can be projected into the subsurface in terms of uh, vis visualization. Uh, down at the bottom, I show a, uh, um, a core and a log that's associated with that core. The last day of the course we spend at the Utah Core Research Center, where we'll actually log a core that's from the same, uh, the same general area. You know, in terms of comparing the outcrop and subsurface, here's an interesting study that was done by, by Hampson and others, uh, in which the, uh, these are the same stratigraphic units in both figures, uh, but one is based on outcrop studies and the other interpretation, the other cross section comes from an interpretation of well logs. You can see that the, uh, the patterns, the general pattern is similar between the two, but there are also some, uh, some differences. So again, understanding these units in outcrop might help us to uh, to better interpret the uh, the subsurface um, material. Uh, the course content, uh, if you were to take the uh, the course in the summer, there we will review the concepts and principles of sequence stratigraphy in some detail, the stacking patterns, surfaces, and so on. Uh, one of the significant aspects, and something that I'm going to do with this presentation, is we're going to hike through a set of stacked pair sequences. Uh, the purpose of this is to notice the repetitious nature of the uh, of the pair sequences and uh, how some of the changes can be used to identify the important services such as sequence boundaries, transgressive surfaces, maximum flooding surfaces. Uh, on the trip, we uh, measure a number of, uh, of sections uh, to uh, look at the lateral variability in, um, in some of these stratigraphic units. I'll show some of that here as, as well so that we can see how uh, these units change from onshore to, to offshore. Uh, there's actually an, an opportunity to see the landward and the basinward pinch outs of some of the major sandstone bodies. Uh, toward the end of the, uh, of the course, uh, photo mosaics are, are provided in which facies maps can be constructed of entire smaller order sequences that are present within single outcrops. And throughout the entire course, we will emphasize the, uh, the concept of multiple working hypotheses. That is, by the, uh, by the time we're done, you know, hopefully we can look at these uh, strata and uh, that they were, they could have been developed in a variety of ways. It's not simply used to see or tectonics, uh, compaction, climate, other things will also play a role. And one last thing before I get to the, uh, get to the photographs, uh, just uh, so that there's an understanding of how I use the terminology, uh, there, um, are several schemes that are used to um, to label sequence stratigraphy. The concepts remain the same throughout all of these. Uh, my preference is to use the model that has four systems tracks, where the the falling stage systems track is su is separated from the high stand, so that there is a uh, part of the system that emphasizes the the forced or regressive nature of uh, a part of the sequence. So I will be discussing things in terms of a falling stage, low stand, transgressive, and high stand systems track. But the system, transgressive systems track is separated by the, the transgressive and maximum flooding surfaces. Oh, and uh, a uh, um, general <clears throat> idea of the geological setting 
Uh, the, the strata of the book cliffs were deposited during the, the late Cretaceous, the Campanian, in a, uh, in a foreland basin. Um, I used the, the model of Deciles and, uh, Deciles and Giles uh, to uh, subdivide the foreland basin into four components. Uh, this particular uh, trip, we, uh, we spend just a little bit of time looking at a couple of outcrops of the synorogenic uh, conglomerates uh, over the wedge top, but most of the course will take uh, place in the, the 4D where we'll start at the bottom of the section and work upward and, uh, and, and basinward toward the end of the, toward the, end of the week. Uh, the, the middle diagram here from uh, Armstrong, which has been redrawn by many people, but I've chosen to use the, the original here, shows that the nature of deposits within this foreland basin are such that we see progradation, backstepping, progradation, backstepping. Uh, that same pattern is uh, exhibited over and over again in the production of a number of third order sequences. The one that we're going to look at is this one right here. You can see the pointer, the Black Hawk Formation in Castlegate Sandstone. Actually, at the base of the, of the uh, Black Hawk is another unit called the Star Point Sandstone. So we, uh, this is the Star Point Black Hawk Castlegate, uh, Castlegate sequence. So over here is simply a map of the state of uh, Utah showing where the book cliffs are located. Down here, the uh, state of Utah is located along the margin between the Western Interior Seaway and the Severe Orogenic Belt. Uh, the course, the uh, first stops of the course are in Lake Fork Canyon to look at the synorogenic conglomerates, and then we finish uh, looking at some of the eustatic effects at Thompson Canyon. And uh, today we're going to focus, though, almost entirely on the middle part here, uh, pretty much within this uh, this rectangle, the area near Helper, Utah. Okay, to the photographs. <clears throat> This photograph is of the cliff face on the north side of, uh, of the town of Helper, which you can see at the, at the bottom of the, of the hill. And here you can, uh, you can see the basal part of this third order sequence. Um, at the bottom of the hill is the Manco Shale, a marine deposit, a very thick uh, mudstone uh, that uh, grades up into the first prominent sandstone, which is the, uh, the panther tongue of the Star Point sandstone. Uh, in, this, uh, in this case, the sequence boundary is actually a correlative conformity. So as you'll recall, the definition of a sequence boundary is, a, is a, an unconformity and its correlative conformities. Uh, in this area, we're looking at a, uh, a forced regressive deposit uh, that was deposited as part of a river-dominated delta. And uh, this is the, the last lobe, the last, uh, the last part of that progradation uh, before uh, accommodation began to accumulate again. And uh, that's where we uh, get the panther. Above the panther, in the uh, stores member, we have interbedded Manco Shale stores, Manco Shale stores. There actually should be a third pair of sequence up here. It's hard to see in this, uh, this photograph. But we're looking at uh, a pattern where we have more shoreline deposits, in this case, more traditional shore face type of, uh, type of a succession. And uh, notice that uh, this sandstone is better developed than the one, than the one above. What this is suggesting is that in this area, as we're moving upward through the stores, the shorelines are not reaching quite as far into the, uh, into the basin. And so we're looking at a retrogradational pair sequence stacking pattern. And uh, that would make the transgressive systems tracked, so the transgressive surface at the base. And the pair sequence that is not well shown in this uh, photo just above is, uh, has a very similar development to this, uh, um, to the one that I'm showing with uh, with an arrow. And that's where I put the maximum flooding surface. I think we've uh, changed into the aggradational pattern as accommodation production has slowed. And then you can see the thick stack of sandstone above that uh, that contains several pair of sequences in the Spring Canyon and Aberdeen members of the uh, of the Black Hawk Formation. Uh, the general pattern is shown in the, uh, in the figure of the lower left-hand corner. <clears throat> Uh, which shows the overall progradational pattern. So we've got the panther and the uh, falling stage, low stand systems track, the backstepping pattern in the stores, transgressive, and then into the, uh, the, the high stand systems track. The figure on the right, which I'm actually going to show another, a number of times through this, uh, this discussion, is a little bit more detailed. And what this shows is that in addition to the third order sequence, there are a number of fourth order uh, sequences that, uh, that are present. So sequences within sequences. Uh, today, I'm not going to discuss these, but you can see that there are a number of incised valley fills, and uh, during the, the field course, we would visit a number of those. So uh, today, we're going to talk about pretty much a vertical section right through here.
the Panther at the base, up through the stores, the Spring Canyon, and to the Aberdeen, and then uh, what we refer to as Black Hawk Undifferentiated, which are the coastal plain deposits, and the terminology of these members has not yet been, uh, been applied. Uh, this is just another illustration of the, uh, of the same interval. Uh, the reason I put this one here is the prior picture. Notice that the, uh, the panther tongue is quite muddy. We're looking at the distal end. If we move just a little bit to the left of the photograph, out of the photograph, so the, the panther is actually, a, uh, in this area, a very well-developed sandstone. Interbedded mudstones at the base and then sandstone. The rest of the succession is the, uh, is the same as what we uh, just discussed. Here is one more time. The reason that I want to show it once more is that this is the area um, that we're going to make a hike through the through the, the section. So if you look at this diagram, uh, I'm standing in uh, in Gentile Wash. We're going to hike up Gentile Wash. We're looking across. Uh, we're going to follow the, the section from the base of the Panther, essentially the uh, the sequence boundary, on up through the stores in the Spring Canyon, and the hike is going to end at the at the top of the Aberdeen. Um, I'm sorry, the top of the Spring Canyon member, close to the contact with the uh, with the Aberdeen. Okay, so let's look uh, at photographs of each of these uh, each of these elements as they as they appear. As I mentioned, the the contact here between the Panther Tongue and uh, and the underlying Manco Shale is a correlative conformity. You know that is there is not an unconformity at the sequence boundary in this location. Down below is the uh, is the Mancos, which is a marine mudstone, and notice that it's gradually, initially, coarsening upward, becoming more and more silty. And uh, I place the sequence boundary about where we start to pick up some of the uh, the thin sandstones. Uh, the uh, the interbedded sandstones become uh, become thicker. The mudstones become thinner vertically through the section till we get up here to the uh, this thicker sandstone body, and uh, we've lost the mudstones. But the sedimentary structures are very similar, and I'll show those to you here in a moment. So with each of these figures, I'm trying to show where of these arrows, where it would occur on this diagram, sequence stratigraphic model, and again, where it would occur on the, uh, the cross-section uh, by, uh, by Hampson. Okay, above the sequence boundary is the, uh, is the panther tongue. As I mentioned, it's the following stage to low stand, uh, to low stand systems track. Here you can see it a little bit, a little bit better. Down at the base, the interbedded nature of the uh, sandstones and, uh, and mudstones, um, grading up into the uh, thicker sandstone intervals. We lose the mud, uh, the mudstone upward. Now uh, this uh, diagram down at the bottom in the subsurface, a little bit more proximally than what we see here, uh, according to some of the literature, the uh, the panther does show a downward stepping, off lapping pattern. And what we're looking at uh, at Gentile Wash is simply the uh, the last of these uh, of these deltas in this this down stepping pattern. Uh, from a distance, looking at this, and one of the things I like to do in the uh, outcrop is to stand off of the the distance and ask uh, ask the participants to identify the depositional system. And in most cases, as we're standing in the, in the uh, distance, the interpretation here is that we're looking at a typical shore face. Uh, the deposit, what, what you'd find in a wave-dominated delta. But when you walk up more closely and look at the uh, at the details, rather than the hummocky uh, bedding that you would uh, see in a, in a standard shore face succession, uh, what we're seeing here is that these are dominated by, by BOMA uh, sequences. So each one of these sandstone beds uh, consists of a um, a structureless sandstone at the base, parallel laminated sandstone toward the uh, top, capped by a ripple bedded uh, sandstone, very fine uh, sand, almost a silt in that case. And in some cases, it will actually demonstrate some, some climbing ripples. Toward the bottom of the succession, we see a little bit more of the top of the, uh, of the boma. And as we get uh, toward the, the top of this interbedded succession, uh, we're seeing more preservation of the basal part of the boma suggesting a progradational pattern. Uh, above this, uh, this lower yellow line, uh, the, uh, the more continuous, uh, continuous bed is where we've pretty much lost the mudstone and we're now looking at stacked BOMA successions. Uh, again, mostly the, the lower portion of it, once again uh, indicating that we are, uh, are looking at a progradational uh, interval. 
The bottoms of these beds often have flute casts and tool marks. Uh, we can have load casts as well. Uh, these indicate high energy, uh, those waning energy. Interpretation is that these are delta front turbidites. And that's one of the things that we use here to distinguish between a river and a wave dominated delta. The river dominated delta is much more likely to have the delta front uh, turbidite types of, uh, of successions. Then above this, uh, this next yellow line, there's another significant change in the character of the, the deposits. I have those up here at the top. Uh, these are primarily structuralist sandstone to parallel laminated with some trough cross bedding in between. Uh, so it appears that these sand bodies were deposited very rapidly and then possibly reworked by, uh, by waves or by, by breaking waves on the, uh, on, the, on the surface. If you stand back and you look at the beds in the upper unit, they tend to be more lenticular in shape. Uh, they're, uh, they're a lot less continuous than they appear in this, uh, in this photograph. And uh, many of them are separated by thin intervals of, of mudstone. The mud is a little bit different than what we see underneath in the Manco Shale. Uh, there are a lot of uh, plant fragments, a lot of carbonaceous material. It appears to have more of a terrestrial type of an origin. So the interpretation for the upper part is that these are channel mouth bars and are separated by mudstones associated with interdeltaic uh, inter bays. I'll talk about the transgressive uh, lag here in a moment. But one other indication that these are deltaic deposits, if you look at the figure uh, down at the bottom of the screen, there's the sequence boundary, the transgressive surface. You can take any one of these beds, and if you follow it from the right to the left, notice that it rises, and eventually each one of these beds comes into contact with what is the actual depositional surface of the, of the delta. So uh, there you can see the uh, declinal forms that are associated with the delta, with the delta front. Okay, still looking at the, uh, at the panther tongue, I'm going to stray away from uh, Gentile Washer for a little bit. We're moving over into Spring Canyon at the mouth of, of a place called Sow Belly Gulch. And in this area, off to the right of the, of the screen, the right of this top photo, uh, I've got an enlargement down below. Uh, the panther tongue looks a lot like it did at, uh, at Gentile Wash at the Delta Front. The main difference here as we're moving more proximally is that the interval of channel mouth bars is much thicker and the uh, portion that consists of the uh, delta front turbidites is much thinner. And then just, uh, just to the left of this photo and across the, the road, okay, right here, if you can see the middle photo where, I'm, uh, where I have the arrow, that's the same outcrop as in the lower right. So I've moved a short distance laterally and uh, notice that the sandstone is quite lens-shaped. Uh, so there's a thick lens-shaped uh, sandstone. It's about 90 feet thick right here at the, uh, at the mouth of, of the canyon. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly clean sand for the most part with a number of shaley partings that are, uh, that are contained within. But the geometry of this thing is a large lens-shaped deposit that's, uh, that's filled with uh, a number of smaller lens-shaped deposits. So in essence, we have channel forms within channel forms. At the base of the uh, channel forms, often there are clay uh, class molds. Uh, they are typically filled by, oops, I've got a mouse here with a hair trigger. Uh, they're typically filled with either horizontal lat, uh, laminations, uh, structuralist sandstone, trough cross bedding. Uh, there are a number of thin intervals that have muddy inner beds. There can be double uh, clay drapes, suggesting some tidal uh, influence along with the flager bedding and some treatalites uh, burrows. So uh, again, so what we've done is we've moved just a little bit further pro uh, proximal in the system, and we've gone from the delta front to the, di to the distributary channels. Uh, I want to look at the channels a little bit more closely. And uh, this uh, figure at the, uh, at the bottom from Oluru and Bata at Acharya, I've never been able to pronounce uh, pronounce that one. Um, he is. Uh, they have created a facies map of uh, of this uh, this channel sandstone, and in here you can see where they've labeled a number of the of the channels. One of the interesting things about this outcrop is that the channels have a wide uh, range of uh, of orientations. The upper left photo is one that uh, that I took. These are channels that are oriented east west. And uh, the other, uh, the right photo is uh, from six to eight in, uh, in the, uh, the photo below as well. 
and uh, those channels are, are oriented north-south. So you've got a, a large distributary channel with smaller distributary channels. These are referred to by Oluru and Bhattacharya as uh, terminal distributary channels. Um, the model that they use is this one. I think it's a very good model. The, uh, the Wax Lake and Atchafalaya deltas in the, uh, the Gulf Coast. And uh, you notice the similarity here. It's a lobe-shaped deposit. Uh, we tend to have a, uh, this image in our minds of the Mississippi Delta when we talk about river-dominated deltas. And I agree with this study that that really is quite anomalous, even in, uh, even in, in the modern. Uh, in the Cretaceous, I think this is a much better, uh, a better model for our, our deltas, a lobe shape with distributary channels that are bifurcating over and over again, becoming increasingly uh, shallow as they approach the sea, and they have a wide range of orientations. So in the Wax Lake Delta, if you look at this channel, it's oriented almost east-west, whereas this one is, is, uh, is pretty much north-south uh, north in its orientation. You know, that fits in well with what we see in the, uh, in the panther. Uh, you know, something that's still a little bit, uh, in my mind anyway, up for discussion is the nature within this delta of these clinoforms. Um, the, uh, the study by Oluru and Bacheloria, Bach uh, suggests that these are landward accreting um, uh, macroforms, and uh, I'm still leaning a little bit more toward the, uh, the lateral accretion aspect. Um, where the, uh, the interpretation comes from, uh, here is a, a map from uh, Van Heerden in 1983 where he mapped the growth of channel mouth bars within the Atchafalaya River. And uh, what he noted was that these bars uh, grow downstream or basinward, they uh, they grow laterally, but they also grow upstream as they're uh, as they're de developed. Uh, whereas the paleo flow direction for the panther tongue is from north to south, and uh, north to south would be left to right in the uh, the lower fo photograph. The uh, the thought is that these are probably landward accreting uh, uh, accreting bed forms. The issue that I have with it is that you know this 90 meter thick uh, or 90 uh, foot thick, uh, about 30 meter thick uh, sand body, uh, disappears completely in the direction of uh, a flow within oh, probably um, a couple hundred meters. And that's an awfully quick uh, you know, disappearance of the, of the sand unit. So you need to go back in there and uh, study some of the paleo currents. But it's a, it's a very interesting idea. But so that you know, there's still some things that, uh, that we're looking at in that, uh, that area. Okay, so sticking to the panther tongue, we looked at the delta front, and then we uh, then we moved over and we uh, looked at the uh, panther um, tongue where it consists of distributary channels, and each of those places we will measure sections and compare them. If we move a little bit further basinward, the panther tongue becomes primarily a mudstone. So now we're looking at the delta front to the to the pro delta environment of the um, of the same stratigraphic unit, and uh, to tried to put all these together. It was a little bit hard to do. The uh, the photos here of the distributary channels and the delta front that we looked at before are actually just a little bit behind us or behind this photo and uh, and out of the photo to, to the left. Uh, the uh, picture of the fine grain deposits is on the right hand side of this. You can see it in this pyramid shaped, uh, shaped hill. Uh, the distance from the distributary channels to the fine grain deposits I'm showing here um, in terms of map distance is about 10 kilometers, but in terms of depositional dip, we're only looking at about a kilometer and a half. So this is a strongly oblique uh, transect. It's uh, it's more along depositional strike than depositional dip, but from uh, back here out of the photo up to this uh, point, uh, you can see down below that there is a significant change in, in facies. So here's one of the places where you get a chance to look at the uh, the scale of the uh, of the unit, but also notice the uh, the change in uh, in heterogeneity. You know, uh, you know, here the sand is much cleaner, although there still are barriers that are present within the sand body. And as we move from the distributary channels to the delta front uh, to the fine grain, we're picking up more and more mudstone and more and more partition, uh, partitioning within the uh, the sand body. And to uh, you know, try to relate this again to the uh, to the Atchafalaya River. Uh, here is the same map that I showed before from uh, Van Heerden, and 
If I were to superimpose on this the outcrops from the panther tongue, I would probably put the distributary channels up about here where we have a wide channel that has other channels that are uh, that would be cutting through it. Uh, maybe the, uh, the delta front channel mouth bars you know, toward the end of the, uh, the outcrop and then a short distance uh, you know, from that, the, the delta front. And here the, the scale is very similar to what we, what we see in the panther as well. So, okay, the, uh, on top of the panther is a very sharp surface that is overlain by the Manco shale. The panther tongue, this is Manco shale, the stores member is up above that. So marine shale directly on top of a deltaic, uh, deltaic sandstone. This is indicative of a significant uh, transgression of, uh, of the shoreline. And uh, to, uh, to look at the transgressive surface in, in detail, what are some other, other evidences that uh, the transgression actually did, uh, did occur? So we've got the mudstone on top. You can see the hammer up here for, for scale. Uh, here's what the surface looks like. The surface is uh, quite undulatory suggesting the development of a ravinement surface as the, um, uh, the fair weather wave base passed up and over these deposits. And then once it was abandoned, a significant amount of bioturbation before it was covered by the marine shale. So here again, we can see it in a lot more detail. Okay, here you can see the erosional ravinement uh, surface quite clearly on top of the, the panther. And uh, these features are present whether we're at the delta front or the distributary channels. Um, here are uh, the ravinement along with some bioturbation, a lot more burrowing, bioturbation, asymmetric ripples. Occasionally there are broken up shell fragments that we, uh, that we find on the surface, as well as carbonized wood fragments and uh, the oppressions of, of wood fragments. So again, indications that the surface was, uh, was abandoned for some period of time, um, had some terrestrial influence associated with it, and then was, was flooded and covered by a marine mudstone. Okay, above the, uh, the uh, transgressive surface would be the transgressive systems tract. So here's the, uh, the Manco shale. Uh, the first pair of sequence within the stores member, a little bit more Manco shale. The next pair of sequence within the stores member. Uh, there's a, a little bit more Manco shale here and uh, another pair of sequence within the stores. And so on this one, you can clearly see that each subsequent pair of sequence, at least for, uh, from the panther through the first two of the stores, each one has a, uh, a less well-defined development than the one before. So the, uh, the idea here is that we're looking at a backstepping, a retrogradational pair sequence stacking, uh, stacking pattern. Um, a, a, a complete deltaic succession overlain by, overlain by the very distal uh, portion of a transition zone into a lower shore face, simply the transition zone and a couple of pair of sequences in, the, in this location. And uh, to look at them more closely, we're back now in uh, Gentile Wash. We're making the hike up Gentile Wash. And as we, uh, we hike through, we, we actually uh, come into close contact. You can put your, your fingers on and uh, take uh, photographs of and uh, describe these, uh, these pair of sequences in detail. So this is the, uh, the first pair of sequence within the stores member. Okay, so remember below us is the panther tongue, which is a delta, then a marine mudstone. And here we have the, uh, the mancos is actually at the base of the, of the photo. We're coming through the transition zone where we have alternating mudstones and sandstones. The sandstones consist of hummocky bedding in, uh, in this case, more typical of a wave dominated delta or prograding shore face. Uh, they become amalgamated toward the top. So we go from the transition zone into the lower, the lower shore face. Moving up the canyon, this is the second pair of sequence within the, uh, the stores member. Uh, once again, we've got mancos at the bottom, interbedded mancos and, uh, and hummocky bedded sandstone in the, in the stores. Uh, but we, uh, we lack the, uh, the lower shore face. We really don't get out of the transition zone here. We become more proximal upward but we, uh, we don't get out of the lower shore face. So this shoreline did not prograde as far into the basin as the underlying shoreline, again, suggesting that we are undergoing a retrogradational pattern. And to uh, show it in a little bit uh, larger scale, uh, pair sequence one, pair sequence two, and this is the third pair sequence within the stores. 
These two in uh, this diagram, you can finally see them uh, fairly well, that they have very similar development associated with them. So uh, where we've got uh, backstepping, now where the development of these two pair of sequences is very much the same, we've gone from a retrogradational pattern into an aggradational pattern, and this is where we would place the maximum flooding surface. And again, as we hike up through there, you get to see each one of these uh, close up and uh, try to determine where you want to put that surface. Now another diagram, another angle showing the uh, same pair sequence one, two, and uh, three within the uh, stores. Uh, and then notice that above <coughs> this, uh, this surface, after deposition of the uh, third pair sequence in the stores, we move into the Spring Canyon, and then we, uh, we clearly have progressively better uh, preservation of the, uh, the pair sequences. Uh, this one uh, moves from the, um, from the, the Manco Shale through a, a, uh, the transition zone into lower shore face. Uh, the next sequence is actually fully developed. You can see the white cap on there. That suggests that we uh, that we go all the way through the upper shore face and foreshore and uh, probably have some coal or at least some organic material that's preserved on top producing acid, which uh, would then uh, move downward through this sand body, leaching the feldspars and leaving the, uh, the white cap. And we can see that again above in the, uh, the, the next pair of sequence. Then we have a little bit of a transgression once again at the uh, at the base of the Aberdeen, and then the uh, another shoreline pair of sequence in the Aberdeen member of the of the Black Hawk Formation. Okay, uh, this means uh, this suggests that we have moved then into the high stand systems track. We're now looking at a pattern in which the pair of sequences are becoming more sandy, uh, a little bit uh, a little bit thicker, and each one is prograding further into the basin than the one uh, than the one before it. Here's a close-up of the uh, of the Spring Canyon formation, where again you can see that relationship. Okay, so then hiking through these pair of sequences. Um, okay, we're now into the high stand uh, systems track, and uh, notice that this pair of sequence is very similar to the one that we saw before in the stores. This is why I put the uh, the maximum flooding surface below this unit and above uh, above the other. Um, we're probably looking at an aggradational pattern in which the pair of sequences have very similar development to, uh, uh, to one another. Moving upward through the Spring Canyon, this is the next pair of sequence, and uh, now we move from the transition zone back into the lower shore face. So this, uh, this next pair of sequence has a greater development than the one underneath. The shoreline has prograded a little bit further into the basin. Moving upward, this is that, uh, that next pair of sequence, the one that was fully uh, developed. Transition zone, lower shore face, into the uh, upper uh, where the where I have the arrow would be the uh, the upper shore face and the uh, the foreshore. And there's the pair of sequence flooding surface, and then the uh, the next pair of sequence is uh, is quite thick, going from uh, marine shale through transition zone, the various parts of the uh, um, of the shore face, lower, upper, and uh, foreshore. Then we have another pair of sequence boundary right through uh, right through here and there's some coal on top of this one to look at it a little bit more closely this is that same thick pair of sequence the lower part of it where you can see the inner bed of sandstone and uh, hummocky sandstone and mudstone the upper part of it and this uh, figure is clearly shown the uh, trough cross bedding of the upper shore face and the parallel laminations present in the the foreshore deposit so the uh, the spring canyon and the uh, and the stores actually uh, are more indicative of a wave-dominated delta and a prograding uh, uh, shore face succession uh, the, that we commonly see. This is a very typical um, vertical profile that's uh, made of these deposits. Uh, this one is uh, modified a little bit after Van, uh, Van Wagner. So down to the bottom of the marine much, uh, mudstones separated by the hummocky bedded sandstones, which become amalgamated toward the top trough cross bedding, parallel laminations, and coal, which you can see in the upper left photo over here at the, at the, uh, the top of the, of the succession. So in this case, we have a fully developed shoreline. And this is what we see through pretty much the rest of the, uh, the Black Hawk formation as we move upward and, uh, and basinward through the, through the section. Um, this, uh, 
this kind of a, of a sequence. Um, we do take some time to, uh, to look at the, uh, the, the landward pinch out of, uh, of the pair sequences. So looking at this uh, figure here, if I go back a couple of, uh, of slides or a few slides, okay, these two, uh, these two pair sequences, the one at the top is really thick, and, uh, and this one, the first two well-developed pair sequences in the Spring Canyon are the same two that you see on the right side of this lower photo. Okay, the, the upper photo shows the big picture. You see the panther at the base through the storage, that same succession, and we're, uh, we're looking up in the, uh, the rectangular box. Then down at the bottom, you can see those well-developed pair of sequences. But the upper one, notice what happens to it as you follow it to the, to the left. Over here, it, uh, it pinches out, and it's replaced on the left by interbedded, sorry about that, by interbedded mudstones and, uh, and sandstones. And over here, the sandstones are dipping in a landward direction, whereas in the, uh, the thicker sand, uh, bedding is oriented, dipping toward the, uh, toward the, the basin. Uh, the thought here is that we are looking at a uh, barrier island that then developed into a progradational uh, beach following this, uh, this rise in, in base level. On the landward side um, are some washover fan deposits interbedded with lagoonal muds. And as we move just a little bit further inland from that, this is that same lagoonal succession back at uh, Sow Belly Gulch over by Spring Canyon now. So uh, here's a, uh, the thick sandstone is out of the picture. This is that lower well-developed sandstone. This is the, uh, the lagoonal bed deposit and a little bit of, uh, of an enlargement. So here you can see the coal of the underlying parasequence, lagoonal mud on top, on top of that. So that would be the parasequence boundary. And then uh, the sandstones in this, uh, this case, notice that it coarsens upward. These have been interpreted as a bayhead delta. The model down at the bottom, prograding sand, base level rises, barrier forms, lagoon behind it. Once the lagoon is filled, the barrier island is going to prograde and form the next sandstone, uh, sandstone parasequence. But there are a number of indicators in here to show that we do have uh, a significant amount of tidal influence along with the uh, um, or behind the wave-dominated shoreline deposits. And just to round it off in, uh, in this, uh, this area, once we uh, finish looking at the Spring Canyon, then we, uh, we go back over to the, uh, to the highway and look at the overlying deposits. The Spring Canyon member is overlain by the Aberdeen member. The Aberdeen member is very similar in characteristic to the, to the Spring Canyon. And there's a uh, flooding surface on top of uh, on top of that, and and uh, overlying it now are coastal plain deposits that are equivalent to the remaining members of the of the Black Hawk Formation, uh, the uh, the Kenilworth, Sunnyside, uh, Grassy, and uh, and the Desert are all represented here by coastal plain. Uh, it's referred to as Black Hawk undifferentiated because uh, there's not yet been an attempt to separate this into uh, into members to try to, uh, to correlate it with the uh, the shoreline bit deposits. Now, as we move basinward during the, the week of the of the field course, this interval starts to uh, appear very similar to what we see here in the uh, the lower units. In the spring uh, these take on the appearance of the Spring Canyon and the Aberdeen. The Aberdeen and the Spring Canyon merge into the Manco Shale and uh, and become uh, become shale deposits. Um, you know, ultimately, the entire succession becomes a marine shale to the, uh, to the east. Uh, the succession is overlain by the Castlegate sandstone at the top of the picture here and in the, the lower right, a very thick braided stream deposit. Um, most workers in the area ascribe a sequence boundary at the base of the, of the Castlegate. That's another one of those things that uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more, more dubious about. Uh, some of that has to do with its position within the, uh, the proximal part of the foreland basin and whether or not uh, eustatic uh, impacts would be, uh, would be felt this far, uh, this far upstream. Further basinward, I think that a sequence boundary at the base of the uh, Castle Gate works very well, but here I'm not, uh, not certain. That should be a KC, not a KS. And a close-up picture of the, uh, of the material here. Okay, so with, uh, with that, that's... Uh, you know, that's basically it for the, the slides that I had prepared for, uh, for this presentation. 
Uh, again, mostly we're looking at the, just the proximal part of this, and if we took the field course, we would look at the at the changes as they occur in a uh, in the base word direction. So I guess with that, we can take any questions. Thanks, Bill. Um, we do have a few minutes now for questions. So if our listeners want to type their questions in the question box, we'll, we're starting to receive some of those now. Um, I'll remind everyone that later today you'll receive a link to a recording of today's webinar. Uh, we'll ask you to fill out an evaluation form, and we'll also provide you with registration details for Dr. Little's field trip. This is the one to the Book Cliffs, Utah, a case study in coastal sequence stratigraphy. It's offered by SCA next year in May, May 6th through 10th, 2019. So you want to start making your travel plans now. Uh, last um, summer, Dr. Little's course sold out, so you don't want to wait too late and miss, miss the opportunity. Okay, here's the first question. Do all the distributory channels show a basal lag? There are smaller um, ones and larger ones. No. Let me go back to that uh, that picture if I if I can. It's way back at the beginning. Um. They they don't, and I think that uh, uh, now the the larger channels are more likely to have the uh, the basal lag than the smaller channels. And I think that part of the reason for that is that we're lo looking at channel abandonment and then uh, reoccupation in, in some cases. And really, what you're seeing filling these channels in most cases is further channel mouth bars. Um, a lot of times, such as this uh, this one. There is a nice mud drape down at the uh, down at the, at the base where the channel was abandoned. It appears as though mud settled over the uh, surface, and then later the channel was reoccupied and uh, and sand was deposited within. Okay, uh, the next question is about the scale. Uh, can you tell us more about the width of these channels and the height of some of these features that we're seeing in your photographs? So yeah, the uh, the entire succession here, uh, you know, this um, is probably around 30 meters, um, 100 feet, maybe uh, maybe 90 feet for the entire succession. The smaller channels that are contained uh, that are contained within, most of these are just uh, you know a meter to maybe two or three meters thick. Uh, in terms of uh, of width, we're probably looking at up to tens of meters for the the smaller channels. Uh, the, uh, the larger scale ones can be uh, several hundred meters across. Very good. So the next question is related to the occurrence of landward accretionary elements. Are they common? And when they occur, how, how often do they occur? Okay. Uh, this is really my first exposure to them. And, uh, and my understanding of them comes uh, pretty much from this uh, this paper from Olaru and uh, Bhattacharya. Um, this is uh, maybe part of my my skepticism of, of applying that still down here at the at the bottom. Uh, but according to uh, their studies, and they've looked at a couple of other deltas in uh, in the Soviet Union and elsewhere, uh, they seem to think that it's a fairly common process. <clears throat> and uh, and what this is on the uh, upward the the landward accreting part is a a filling of the of the previous distributary channel by uh, portions of the uh, channel mouth bar. And uh, in this paper, they do have some, uh, some pretty good photographs of the, uh, of the landward uh, accretion. So I think it does occur. I'm just not convinced that uh, that's what's taking place, uh, place here. But it, it does appear to be a fairly common uh, feature in uh, river-dominated deltas. But I'll have to defer to uh, them for any more on, uh, on uh, that one for now. Uh, related to those analogs, you've provided the the modern analogs, the Wax Lake and Atashapalaya deltas. Um, what are some analog oil and gas producing formations or oil and gas basins that you might consider analogs to the book cliffs? Um, well, when the when the group was here from Nigeria last year, they thought that maybe the, the Niger Delta was a good example for uh, uh, for some of that in the um, uh, some of the stuff that they're working on out there. Uh, obviously, 
uh, many of the Cretaceous basins through the western and interior from uh, uh, New Mexico and Arizona on up through uh, uh, Wyoming and, uh, and Montana. Uh, some of the others, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not as familiar as I probably should be, but I'll, uh, I'll make sure to pick that up. Certainly Inter there's a... Uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, certainly there's international interest in in your field trip. We had quite a a uh, multicultural group uh, from all over the world uh, registered to attend today. So I think there's quite a bit of interest. So there is, and that's, uh, I, I'm actually uh, working on, on gathering uh, additional analogs. That, that's an active part of what I'm working on. Very and, good. I don't, Can you uh, tell don't, us a little bit more about um, some of the elements of the field trip that you try to point out um, during the week? Oh, sure. The uh, on the uh, on the first day of the trip is is basically a broad overview. Uh, the, uh, the 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 second uh, where we go uh, through the the sequence stratigraphy in, in general and and uh, and how and, and familiarize people with the uh, the stratigraphic units. Uh, the, the second day is spent almost entirely in the panther tongue. That's where we look at it in uh, detail, measure sections at the uh, at the localities that I showed in here, and, and compare those to uh, to one another. Um, on the uh, on the third day, we make the, the hike through the entire succession from the bottom of the panther to um, to the top of the Spring Canyon, and then we try to visit some of the other localities within the Spring Canyon member uh, where we can. Look at the landward pinch out that we have to do with binoculars, but we can uh, we can visit and walk up to uh, the outcrop that has the uh, the back barrier deposits associated with it. From there, we uh, we begin to move uh, to move eastward. We we visit a couple of uh, of other locations where we can uh, look at the uh, the same interval, but where it appears a little bit uh, a little bit differently. In part because there has been some inc incision by these lower uh, or these higher order, uh, smaller scale sequences. So we can see some of the incised valley fills, uh, some uh, very strongly uh, influenced, uh, tidally influenced deposits that are associated with uh, uh, with those. Um, and we uh, we look at those in a couple of localities. Look at a wave dominated delta quite closely at uh, um, at Woodside Canyon. Uh, the uh, the next day. Uh, we're looking more at things in terms of a regional scale. So we find a couple of, uh, of spots where uh, we have very long photo mosaics stand off in a distance, and uh, the participants can map out uh, the uh, the basinward pinch out and and see how these uh, de body uh, these sand bodies become separated into uh, the thicker ones and this thinner sand bodies separated by mudstones. Um, and then we. Uh, uh, in Tusher Canyon and Thompson Canyon, we provide other photo mo mosaics where there are complete fourth order sequences exposed in a single outcrop. Uh, they take time to uh, to describe those outcrops, measure the, the sections there, take the photo mosaic, draw the boundaries on it, and we have a detailed discussion of, uh, of those features. And the last thing that we do, uh, there are these um, isolated sand bodies that are present within the uh, uh, the Manco Shale that are thought to correlate to one of the uh, the members of the of the Black Hawk uh, that uh, some have referred to as, as detached low stand uh, dead deposits. Um, they're uh, they're not very thick. They're uh, they're not very wide, and they're they're scattered throughout the, uh, the the basin. We stop. We visit one of those so they they can uh, um, basically see all the different aspects of the of the sequence before we're done. So the Manco Shell is one of the emerging uh, areas for unconventional reservoirs. Any any comments on how that might translate to those types of uh, deposits? Um, I haven't spent much time in the Mancos yet. Um, I've just gotten uh, access to a handheld uh, gamma ray uh, machine. One of the things that I want to do this summer is to take some of these uh, or go to some of these outcrops of the Manco Shale that we no correlate to the, uh, the the more sandy parts of the section, and uh, and make some gamma ray logs through these and see if we can identify some of the uh, some of the cycles. Now, uh, when you look at the Manco sh Shale, there are clearly cyclical events contained uh, contained within. 
Uh, you know, how they correspond specifically with the sandstone units, uh, you know, I don't know at this uh, this point, but there uh, there is sequence particularly that can be done in the Mancos, and that's a developing part of the project. The next question is, is, is there any evidence of tectonic events on the outcrops, and how can you relate uh, to those with the structures we see in the outcrops? Okay, you know, the, uh, you know, part of the challenge that we have here is distinguishing eustatic events from tectonic events. And, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure that we can, looking at a particular outcrop, say that a, a specific surface was developed because of basin subsidence rather than base level, base level rise. But my thoughts are that in the very proximal part of the basin, most of what we're seeing is tectonically controlled. And that's part of why we stopped to look at the syntectonic conglomerates in the Lake Fork uh, Canyon, uh, Canyon area. Uh, as we move more basinward, by the time we get to Thompson Canyon, uh, I do think that we're looking at a significant uh, amount of eustacy. Uh, and the reason that I, I differentiate between the two is in the proximal part of the, of the basin, where the, the deposits are the coarsest, and where you would expect to see deeper incision if the, uh, if the result was from a, a drop in base level, we really don't see that. We see stacked very coarse deposits that uh, uh, that really have no incision into the material underneath. And so I think that in the proximal part of the basin, we're looking at primarily space that's created by tectonic activity. For the distal part of the basin, we still see that, but we're uh, beginning to see some of the eustatic control. And uh, and that's where we're seeing the incised valley fills as the as base level drops and there's incision into the underlying shoreline deposits that are backfilled by tidal and then fluvial uh, systems. And this is, this, is part of my, this is part of my questioning of the sequence boundary at the base of the, uh, of the castle gate in the proximal part of the basin. Related to the wave dominated parts of the sequence are longshore bars and barrier islands well preserved in the record of the book clips. Uh, the barrier islands are preserved, but they're the most proximal. They're at the landward pinch out of the uh, of the thick sandstone pair sequences. And the main reason that uh, the main way that we can identify the barrier islands is by the lagoonal deposits that are present uh, behind them, such as I showed at the uh, very end of the um, of, of the discussion. So let me go back to that figure down here at the. Uh, at the bottom. So in uh, in this case, or let me, let me go to this one first. So down at the uh, at the bottom, uh, these sandstones show very strong basinward progradation, but they also terminate abruptly on the on the landward end. So this is what I uh, have been referring to as the landward pinch out. Uh, so base level rises, the uh, the surface is flooded and then uh, progradation occurs again. Once this back barrier I, uh, area is filled with sediment, then the, uh, the barrier island will, uh, will transform into a progr progradational beach succession, a typical short phase type of a succession, and build landward. And so the, uh, the way that we identify it, going back to this picture, so this is, if, uh, if you were to measure a section right here, we see KBA at, up at the, uh, up at the uh, top, uh, this would look like two stacked beaches. You come just a, uh, a few tens of meters over, you measure a section through the exact same interval, and over here it's going to look like a lagoonal uh, succession on top of one of the beaches. It's a very abrupt landward pinch out, and uh, this is what I would think of as the barrier island, and then uh, these, this is the lagoonal succession. So the, uh, the barrier islands are, uh, are just uh, very small scale features that are located at the landward terminus of the major sand bodies. Um, you showed an example. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, as far as the uh, the longshore bars, there are examples. Uh, the uh, the deltaic deposit that we look at in uh, in Woodside Canyon near the top, there are some uh, lagoonal type uh, sediments, and I think that those are deposits that accumulated behind a, a longshore bar. You showed an example where a prograding clinoform died out about 100 meters and suggested it was too short a distance for lateral accretion. What is a good scale to be used for such features to be interpreted 
as bar growth along a channel. Yeah, and let me bounce it back and forth here. Let's see. Mm -hmm. That's actually a little bit. Yeah, that's this one here at the bottom. Yeah, um, my, uh, my thoughts here is that I think that these are lateral accretion. At least that's where I'm leaning right now. But I'm, uh, uh, I'm still uh, you know, seriously looking at, uh, um, at what was done by, uh, by, by these other workers. Um, and uh, you know, the, the reason that I like lateral accretion rather than, there are a couple reasons that I like lateral accretion rather than the, the landward accreting out of this. One of them, if I go up just a little bit further, okay, the, uh, the major channel that you see in the, in the middle up here, Again, this is about 30 meters thick. Where I'm standing, I'm standing in the direction of, uh, of flow about, uh, well, probably about 200 meters uh, away. So that thick sandstone would have to completely die out uh, by the time that it reached the, the point where I'm standing. And, uh, and I, I'm having trouble visualizing the, uh, you know, that the, uh, the front of the, del uh, of the delta without thinning is going to end that, uh, that quickly. And so the, uh, the thought behind that, that, uh, that suggests that these are the landward accreting macroforms is that the, uh, the paleo flow, the general paleo flow of the delta is, uh, is toward the, uh, the person looking at the, um, at the, at the photograph. Now, uh, the other thing, uh, this valley that uh, that runs along the, the this cl cliff face, you know, I think it is along the margin of the sandstone. That's the reason that the valley is there; that it's eroding down into the into the muddier de deposits. But I think that this is a lateral uh, that was formed by lateral accretion, and that the uh, the paleo current in this outcrop is from left to right, not from uh, in the screen to uh, out of the screen. Did did that make sense? Yes. Thank you. So, Bill, thank you today for the webinar. We're nearing the end of our time commitment, and we've had some great questions. I want to remind all the attendees that later today you'll receive a link to a recording of today's webinar, an evaluation form, and registration details for Dr. Little's field trip to the Book Cliffs, Utah, a case study in co coastal sequence stratigraphy that's offered by SCA May 6th through 10th in 2019. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks.